Hello, 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 and welcome to today's episode of Her Version. This podcast is dedicated to sharing stories of struggle to triumph, a platform that allows individuals to tell their truth in order to inspire and uplift others. For those of you that are new to this podcast and like content like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like and share. I am your host. Let's jump right in. My name is Sabrina. Thank you for joining us at the Her Version podcast. This platform is built on storytelling and the understanding that many times our greatest learning experiences come from learning from other people's stories. Today, I am speaking with an amazing woman named Nikki. Nikki is a happily married mother of two children living in South Florida. Yay, Florida. But it was not always that way. Nikki, once a high school cheerleading captain and aspiring mathematician, took a sharp turn in her early years to being a college dropout and a homeless prostitute. Her time in the street, both in Lake Worth Beach where she once unsuccessfully rehabbed and in New Jersey, where her family lived, was filled mostly by short stints in jail for possession, DUI, and theft. She is not only she is not the only one, and that is why she is here speaking today. The nation's health experts report that nearly 21 million Americans, or about one in every seven, struggle with addiction. Only a fraction, one in 10, will get treatment. As a last resort, Nikki's family, back in 2016, reached out to the Dr. Phil show to try and save Nikki from herself. Now looking back, Nikki credits Dr. Phil's staff for putting her on the road to recovery. Her her sober start was Christmas Day 2016. I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome, Nikki. Sorry about that. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right. My eyes started going a little cross there for a second. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am so good. I'm so um, happy to have you here. Um, I love your story. I know that that's weird to say. Um, but I really do. I, I want, as soon as I talk to you, I obviously watched the Dr. Phil show and, um, you know, obviously we had spoke first. So just seeing the transition just like warmed my heart (laughs) so much to real realize that like people can do this. Yeah. I encourage people when they, especially when they first meet me, um, to go watch the Dr. Phil show. I'm like, you need a little context to see that, like, this is a miracle. And it's, I could say it, but to see it really um, makes it real. It yeah. Real. <laughs> yeah. And I, I hate to say, you know, the, the drug of, the drug that they're highlighting on the Dr. Phil show is heroin. Is that, was that the only thing that you were, or were you dabbling in other stuff? I was dabbling. And like, I am of the belief that I, I was like born an alcoholic. Um, so, you know, obviously, um, when I got to that point, when I was on the show, heroin was what primarily took me down, but I had problems with everything. Like I never drank like other people. I never drank successfully. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just it, think it just led me to heroin because of the, the relationship I had with myself. I think heroin um, made it easiest to live with myself. I didn't like myself. Yeah, a hundred percent. I um, I just it, my heart goes out to your sister so much watching that. Her getting so angry. I'm assuming that you guys have like come together so, and a lot. It it. You know, I tell uh, this is like another experience I share. Like it, it takes time, and like that yeah. was one of the more challenging relationships, and and to some extent still is. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate that like I have been able and allowed to be present in my niece's life. You know, my daughter has since had her own child, um, and you know, I gave my family really no reason to trust me or believe that I would get sober. So. I know it was very difficult for them, you know, even when I was celebrating a year, I mean, even now with almost six years sober, um, if I like don't answer my phone for a couple hours, that's still where their mind is going to go, you know, and like that's still real to them, you know, it's still very real to them. And I think that like, 
the ability that I've had to be present for, especially my mom and sister who were on the show with me. Um, I mean, I really dragged them through it. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that for sure. So if you don't mind, I would like to just kind of hear a little bit, you know, obviously not everyone's seen the show. P.S. I am a huge Dr. Phil, like <laughs> ridiculous fan. Um, and I think we, I told you that when we first um, were talking, like, I bet I've seen, which I had not seen the episode. Okay. But I bet you I have seen this episode because I watched Dr. Phil, the reruns, you know, on, um, on YouTube. I was yeah. Running. Um, in the background, like what I'm cooking or what have you, I'll just glance up to see who, what everyone looks like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Continue watching. But I love Dr. Phil. I love that you were, that, you know, you're like a real life example of what, <laughs> of what came out of that. But if you could share a little bit about, you know, your, a little bit about your story, your background, your journey, where you are now. Sure. And, um, we'll kind of just flow, flow from there. Sure. So, um, if you, Google the Dr. Phil show, you will like see me right at, I would say like a very pivotal moment in my life and my story. Um, when I was on the Dr. Phil show in 2016, I was eight months pregnant with my first child. Um, I had been homeless for the better part of a decade. I wasn't working. I was in and out of jail. I was sustaining like a very, very massive drug habit, um, you know, through theft and prostitution, which I, you know, would spend intermittent periods in jails and, and, and facilities um, as a result of. So I had completely lost touch with my family who was back in New Jersey. I kind of would bounce back and forth between New Jersey and Florida. Um, I'm from New Jersey. I actually live in Florida now. I, I actually got sober in Florida after spending a lot of time on the streets in Florida. Um, the Dr. Phil episode was actually filmed down here in the same city that I now own a home in, which is crazy. I used to like sleep in a field two miles from here. Wow. Um, so at that point, I, I had found out that I was pregnant um, when I was in jail. I was about six months pregnant at the time. It was hard to like estimate. Um, I didn't see a doctor at all during that time. I had no prenatal care. I, I overdosed multiple times during my pregnancy. Um, and it's hard to get into treatment in this country if you don't have insurance. Um, it's really hard if you're pregnant. And like, I, I wish I had an answer for that. Um, but my family, I mean, my family literally wrote the Dr. Phil show to get me help. So like, I am very fortunate for that because I don't think my, I mean, like there's some divine intervention because like who gets a call from the Dr. Phil show on Facebook yeah. Messenger, you know? Um, I was sitting outside, you know, pondering what I was going to do next. This message pops up on my phone. Uh, it was one of the producers from the Dr. Phil show. And they told me they were interested in my story and helping me. And at that point, like, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had completely spiraled my life out. All of my attempts to get sober had failed me in the past. And I said, like, what, um, what do I have to lose at this point? Um, so I agreed to do the show. I knew they were going to send me to treatment, which was like, of course, was the goal. Like I didn't, I didn't want to live the life I was living anymore. Like I absolutely didn't want to do that. But like the thought of, you know, now it's not just me. I have this child inside of me. Like I don't know how to even human on my own, let alone raise another small human. And like I didn't know which sounded worse, like me dying on the streets of Lake Worth or me getting sober and like all of my experiences with with not drinking and using have been like really unhappy you know drugs and alcohol really um made me like comfortable in my own skin for years and years and years it was you know what it was the only coping mechanism i had so when i agreed to do that um the first thing they did after the show was they got me some prenatal care and i was very pregnant. Like I was um, about to give birth. I gave birth seven weeks after that, my first prenatal appointment. So I was discharged from the treatment center. Um, I went home and I had my baby. She's beautiful and she's perfect. And she is going to kindergarten next year. I went to her kindergarten roundup today. Like I, yes. so I had her and like something other than me had plans because I used for 32 weeks of my pregnancy and she came out perfect. And, um, I thought in that moment, you know, it was like one of the most powerful things that stuck with me. 
I thought in that moment that being a mother was going to be enough to keep me sober. And like, it's, it's so difficult. It's like such a stigmatizing thing right mm -hmm. now, but like, I could not stay sober for that like perfect little child. And I didn't stay sober. Um, and like the good people at the Dr. Phil show sent me back to treatment again. Um, and I got sober when my daughter was three months old. Um, and that was like, you know, something I didn't think was possible. I, would sooner have accepted the fact that like I would have died on the streets than like the fact that, you know, I got sober and, you know, have a life today that is like built on, you know, so many other things that like had, no, I had no interest on, you know, helping others, being a mom, being present. And like, I have this amazing life today that started from that, that crazy Dr. Phil episode. That's awesome. When you, so you originally went, ha then had your baby. Yes. And then relapsed. Yes. And so then do you just call Dr. Philip on his cell phone and say, hey? <laughs> I, wish, <laughs> I wish. People ask me all the time, like, do you just call Dr. Phil? I was like, I wish. No. Um, my mom would lose it. She's like a diehard Dr. Phil. Yes. Me too. Yeah. I would too. <laughs> I, um, I communicated. Um, and I will say that, like, when Dr. Phil saw me, when I did my first follow-up, I've done a couple follow-ups. He, like, couldn't even believe. He's like, is this you? You know? Um, and he is like a good guy. He really is. He's been like that every time I've seen him again, but I don't contact him directly. Um, I, I've, I actually got arrested. I relapsed after I had my daughter, I got arrested again. And, um, my family, like they don't bail me out or anything. I just like sit in jail and I called the Dr. Phil show. And I was like, listen, you guys, I was like, I had been from putting jail? from jail. That was my one phone call. I called the Dr. Phil show. <laughs> so, I had been putting off going back to treatment because I really believed my daughter was going to keep me sober. You know, at that instant, like I didn't want to use, I thought I would never want to use again. And like, I really didn't have a lot of education on like, you know, what has gotten and kept me sober now. And I just like, I couldn't imagine that like the love of my child was not going to be enough. So I put off, you know, the, the plan was always for me to go back to treatment. And I didn't, I just ignored these people when they were calling me trying to help like Nikki, you had the baby, like, please come back to treatment. Um, and then, you know, the universe intervened and I got arrested and suddenly I became a bit more willing <laughs> to, to go back to wow, treatment. Wow, no yeah. kidding. Where was the baby? Was she with your mom? So... My child was removed by DCF um, and placed with my sister. Um, and that's like another huge, huge part of my story. Um, you know, I almost lost my parental rights, like before I had the ability to be a parent. Um, I didn't get my daughter back until she was about 18 months old. And when she was 13 months old, um, the state of New Jersey told me that like I was not fit to have my child back, you know, even though I had a year plus of sobriety, they told me that it would be more appropriate for my sister to adopt my child. Um, and, you know, that was heartbreaking. And like it was, you know, a lesson in emotional sobriety that I'm very thankful for today. But like in that instant, you know. It, it's why I'm like, I, I believe in, you know, this power and like this, this like experience that I've had that has gotten me sober because I knew I was doing the right thing, being in Florida, helping other women, you know, I was just getting started, like working in the field. And like, I really felt like I, this is where like God and the universe wanted me to be was like here helping others. And I, I really knew in that moment, like sitting in the courtroom, even though they told me like, we're changing your goal to adoption. Like I knew that my job as like a human was to, to help others. And like, if the universe wanted me to have my child back, like if I keep doing the right thing, that's, that's what's going to happen. And that's what did happen, which is crazy. That's awesome. How was the atmosphere between you and your sister during this time? Was it gratefulness? Was it frustration? Was it? It was a lot of both. And like, like I said, I totally understand um, the hesitancy from my family. And, you know, I, I, I am very, again, grateful for like the spiritual experience and like enlightenment and, and the, the, the women that have surrounded me and kept me accountable because I was able to see like, you know, I, I am like expecting these people to believe me and like, why should they believe me? So, you know, I totally understand you know, why my sister 
was not in agreement with me having my child back and why she thought, you know, she's just going to relapse again. Like it's just going to happen again. Um, and I totally understand that, you know, um, it didn't make it easier to, to, you know, it doesn't not hurt, you know, like I say that all the time, like it is one thing to like, look, take a seat back and like, remember, you know, I go through this for a reason. There's a reason that I'm struggling. There's a reason that I'm going through this pain. Like there's going to be a purpose for me to use this. There's a bigger plan that I can't see, but like that doesn't take away the pain, you know, uh, being told that like, you're not going to have your child back and we are going to terminate your parental rights like that hurt. And it like strain, it did, it strained, I mean, our entire family dynamic as addiction does and like continues to do, you know, that, you know, for a couple of years into my sobriety. Yeah. I yeah. bet. I bet. And now you have another little one. Yes. I, I uh, married. I, yes. yes, I got married. Um, my husband, um, adopted my daughter, which is oh. amazing. I know. I mean, he, he's daddy and now we have two kids. We, um, have a little boy now too, which is awesome. We have a, so a little one-year-old. Yeah. Who's crazy. He's a little crazy boy. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's like an experience, you know, my daughter is like my little miracle, you know, like I, I almost lost her. And like, I know like the pain of not being able to stay sober for her, but like what a different experience it is to, to, to be a sober mother. Like I experienced my entire pregnancy sober. I gave birth sober and like, it was, it's amazing. No one showed up in my hospital room to take my child away from me, you know, which is um, like an unfortunate, it's like an unfortunate reality, you know? And like, it's what I expected with my first, I was like, okay, like I'm going to just go into labor. They're going to come take this baby from me at the hospital, but then I can go get high and I'll feel a little bit better about it. Like that's where I was at before I got sober. Like I, I didn't even care. Wow. Yeah. Who named your, your daughter, by the way, did you name her? I did. Yeah. What is her name? I don't remember. Adley. Adley. Where do you get that from? So I spent all this time looking in baby books because I like couldn't find anything I liked. And there was a variation of her name in a book, Hadley. And they had like, you know, all the different spellings and all the different variations. And I saw the variation of Adley. And it was like the first name. Naming a human, by the way, yeah, um, is like that what a burden <laughs> like I have to pick a name that someone else is going to go by for their yeah. entire life yeah. um what a responsibility <laughs> yeah. um but like it was the first name that i heard that i was like oh okay and like naming girls so hard right oh my gosh i named my son after my husband and like that was it we were done with that <laughs> easy <laughs> that's great yeah my son um his name is elijah Okay. Um, but we were going between Elijah, Jeremiah, and Sebastian. Oh, I like Sebastian. Yeah. I like all of them. He loves his name, though. So I'm glad That's we good. went with yeah, yeah. What, what, what we went with. So. My son is James, and we got a little creative on the middle name. So he's James Oliver. Oh, I love that. I love the middle name Oliver. I know. Or just the name Oliver, I should say. I know. No matter where. My husband, that was uh, my husband's vote. He liked the name Oliver. But I wanted to like kind of keep the little family tradition going with the first name. So yes, yes, very cute. Well, I love it. Well, congratulations on the marriage and the baby and the all the goodness that's happening in your life. I'm so yes. happy for you and um, and the family that you're creating. You know, I want to ask throughout you know your journey and you know from beginning till now, I'm certain that there was tons and tons of challenges. But I'm wondering if you could share one of the biggest challenges that you went sure. through in your life and what you believe you actually learned from that challenge. Yeah. So I have this awful relationship with myself. And like, I didn't know that, you know, first of all, I think it's just like a struggle I've had my whole life. Like I mentioned before, like I was born with like a piece missing, right? Like I didn't like myself. Um, and like the, the hardest thing for me was like accepting that, you know, I am like a type A, you know, overachiever. So when I like dropped out of college and went off the grid for 10 years, you know, it didn't make me feel any better about myself, uh, obviously. But like the relief and like not only relief and peace and like contentment, but like the support I found with being honest Um it, it has, it has op not only like opened up me and like my connection with myself and like my higher power and like the amazing people that surround me, but like it has shown me that 
you know, what my purpose is. And like, that's why I'm like such as uh, like my purpose is to be helpful and useful. And like the greatest thing I had to face was like being honest with myself. And, you know, it's crazy. And you mentioned this, like right when you opened it, you're like, I love your story. It's a weird thing to say. Right. But like my husband says that he's like, I love when you talk about giving birth to your daughter. Like it's so powerful. You know, I think there's this huge stigma around i mean obviously substance abuse in general and mental health like huge 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 stigma but like obviously like my niche and my passion and what i do now like all of it is i have this soft spot for for mothers you know like i know the pain of like getting honest using during your pregnancy like society does not want to talk about that you know like if i i take care to not read the Dr. Phil comments because like there are people who are like, you should be put to death, you know, like people don't like to talk about that. And there's so many people, there's so many, you know, women and the children being born to them, right? Like there's people out there giving birth and like there's now two generations that could be helped if like we were a little more willing to like be honest and open up. Like there, there's people out there like me that have gotten sober, um, you know, despite their children not keeping them sober in the past. And I think if like we could all, you know, open up and be honest about our struggles, every, I think all all humans, you know, not even, you know, per, you know, particular to my struggles or, or substance abuse in general, if we could be honest about like what's going on, I think we would all be shocked to see that like we could help others with that, you know, with everything. And like, I truly believe in that. Like there is someone out there that I can't help. I don't have the experience with it, but if someone else is willing to be honest with yeah. their experience, they can. Um, and like that I see every day, not just in me. That's like the cool thing. If I see people like getting honest and like realizing like the importance of getting honest with themselves, it's hard. It took me years to be comfortable with myself and like I'm still not sometimes I'm an anxious person um like we can help others like and yeah. that is that's cool <laughs> you know like that is the good stuff that's why you know getting sober was cool but like seeing other people get sober is even cooler <laughs> you know yeah for sure I know this is a little off topic but do you know where your type a anxiety kind of stems from is that mommy's side or daddy's side or dad so my dad yeah my dad um also died uh, he's also an alcoholic died of alcoholism he died when i was 17. i wasn't raised by my biological father but like i still maintained a relationship with him for the most part um and like he was a very successful you know good looking guy like super overachiever you know was like a stockbroker by age 22 you know big house you know, married family. Um, but like, he couldn't stop drinking and, uh, he drank wow. himself to death when he was like only 42 years old. Wow. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Wow. How does it feel to know that that's that much success is in your bloodline? So it, it helps is me. Like, is it like heavy for you or is that like cool for you? It's, it's both like, I think when I first got sober, like it was, I was like very overwhelmed about like how to pay homage to my father and like, how do I live up to his legacy? And like, how do I make amends for like, you know, the resentment that I carry towards him? Like, but I think it, it, it helps me to understand him. Like I am just like my father and like, I totally, totally see that now. Like I am my father a hundred percent. And I think it, it, it helps me and it like, it motivates me and it, you know, gives me a lot of understanding. I, you know, I know that some people like disagree with like, you know, is this genetic? Cause I, I, I totally see all of those things. <laughs> like I see, me being my father, I see the issues that came from my father. And like, I see the good things that came from my father too. What are the good things? Tell me. So definitely like, yeah, the type A personality, like I am driven and motivated and like, on I, I see all the things my dad was able to accomplish, like even when he was drinking and like could not stop drinking. And it's, you know, I've like experienced that now in my life. Like spending all that time drinking and getting high, like the way that I did for so long, once I got sober, like, I feel like I can accomplish anything these days. I'm in school full time. I have two kids. Like my advisors think I'm a crazy person. I started my classes last year, uh, a day after I gave birth. They're like, maybe you should take a semester off. I was like, yeah, I 
slow down. <laughs> um, and like, I could totally see that, like, that came from him. You know, my dad was unrelenting. And, you know, obviously my stubbornness and unrelentingness can definitely um, be a fault at times. But I, I can totally see how, you know, I got all those good things from him too. And and like, I'm proud of those things. And like, it's, it's so cool now that I've gotten sober too. My mom and dad split up long before. Like I said, I was raised by my stepdad, he, my, Don. He's amazing. He is my dad. Um, but I think it's helped my mom even understand a lot of those things. Like she'll say it in a way that's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, your dad would do this, your dad, like, and like, she talks about the good things about him, you know? And I think that it, it's even helped her see the good things in him and like see that in a positive light because I know it was really hard for her for a long time because she was of the same belief. Like, why can't you get sober for your girls, you know? And yeah. I think it's really cool to see how me getting sober um, has like changed generations. Like even my kids, you know, three generations, like I'm able to be present as, you know, my both of my kids have two sober parents. And I think like we are – seeing all of that like over so many different generations now it's it's pretty cool yeah that is cool that just gave yeah. me the chills that's so awesome yeah i love that you see that renee's talking to you you want to read that your honesty and transparency are astounding and so needed thank you listen i uh, listen, that's the biggest challenge right the honesty is the biggest challenge and it took me I think being like completely devastated and broken. And I think that's like a common thread you hear in a lot of inspirational people, which is like, I'm like the biggest Ted talk fan ever. Um, I love hearing that stuff. You know, yeah. people when I think once we can like just accept um, and, and, and see the need for change and like, just be honest about it. It is so amazing what we can do with that. It's so empowering to like be honest about your struggles. Like, what an oxymoron, right? But like yeah. the power we find in talking about the things that hold us back. <laughs> 100%, 100%. You know, through, I know you said um, you were, are an AA, did do AA? Yep, I am a um, very, very active AA member. Um, you know, I, I kind of attend a lot of the fellowships, but like I'm a, I guess a big book thumper is what they call That's us. That's what they call it, yeah. <laughs> That's what they call it. <laughs> 